when I read a piece over the weekend in The Atlantic about you know why allowing China into the WTO was a, a harebrained idea, I thought, well, are they all going to say now Buchanan was right? Probably not. Uh, but he joins us now. Pat, great to talk to you. How are you doing? Doing fine, Laura. How are you? I'm uh, I'm great. So they're uh they're going crazy over there on MSNBC and in the pages of the New York Times and there uh, Trump's Trump was blowing up the world about 6 months ago with his rhetoric about North Korea. Now Trump's blowing up the G7. What's what's really going on? What's really going on is the end of the old world order from which the United States has benefited least in a sense that we have contributed more to the defense of the West, defense of Europe, defense of the world during the Cold War and beyond than any other nation. At the same time, we've been running trade deficits uh, in goods of $800 billion a year, which is a tremendous deal for those who are being defended and protected and who are dumping more into the United States than we are allowed to sell into their markets. I think, well, Laura, we're seeing sort of if you will, the, the end of the, quote, New World Order uh, that began in, say, 1991-92 after the Cold War was over when we started moving in this direction. And I think that's what's behind uh, all this acrimony and the frustration and anger of the President of the United States. He realizes what a, what a deal the world is getting at our expense, and he wants to correct it, and the world likes it as it is. Well, and I think when people stop and they see that, in fact, um, things haven't gone well in our trading relationship with Canada, uh, that we've actually had uh, a trade deficit with Canada of about $18 billion when it's properly determined. Uh, you know, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, we're, we are still carrying the, the heaviest load in NATO for military contributions. They still haven't given their fair share. Germany, I think, pays 1% of GDP for the NATO alliance, uh, and we pay 4%. Uh, and, and I think this is music to people's ears, Pat, because I think people for a long time have said, what are we doing with all this foreign aid? All these countries hate us. What, why are we spending all this money? We spent a tr- couple trillion in Afghanistan and Iraq and counting, and what do we have to show for it? And I think people are very frustrated by it, and Trump was elected because of that frustration. That's exactly right. Donald Trump is president of the United States because he said, you know, the the era of basically the freeloading off the Americans for defense and wide open American markets, and you protect your own, and you're dumping your goods here, and everybody's running a trade surplus at our expense. And we got a security deficit as well, defending the whole world. That time is coming to an end. And I do think with regard to the United States and Europe, you're getting a real split here. I just don't think the Americans are going to, or Trump is going to take these trade deficits indefinitely. And I think the NATO alliance is going to come under question as well. I mean, again, what are we, it's the Cold War has been over 25 years. I mean, the Russians are back almost in the Urals. And we're defending the Germans, whose hist- history is not totally pacifist, and who can certainly defend themselves, but we're defending them 25 years after the Cold War is over. And Americans are saying, why? When our wages and salaries are, have been arrested and we're running these trade deficits and our factories are leaving and our jobs are leaving? And this is why Trump is president of the United States. And it was acrimonious. They said, <laughs> Cudlow. Cudlow's finest hour. <laughs> oh, no. Larry Cudlow's like, wait a second. I was just over at cocktail parties that Goldman Sachs is putting on in New York. Now I'm down here in Washington, and I'm a Pat Buchanan populist. Like, he's like, what am I, what's going on here, Pat? This is crazy. I uh, think, well, I think on the trade stuff, Larry's a total free trader. And, but I could see the, the fine hand of Donald Trump and him going out there saying we were stabbed in the back for trade by Justin Trudeau. It's a little overheated, I think, on Trump's part. I think part. it's a little overheated, yeah. yeah. He didn't need uh, to say that. I mean, Navarro's like, there's a special place in hell. I mean, you just can't. I think yeah, some, that was. I think they were instructed, here's your talking point. Yeah. yeah they and, were both identical talking points almost. Yeah, and I think Navarro was, he was being the, uh, he's, he's, he's the guy with the piano wire and the, and, and the uh, godfather. <laughs> Pulling him right, is that Barzini? I can't remember. It was like putting the, putting the, uh, yeah, they're putting the the piano Switch wire with the fishes now. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, the only Canadian, only Canadian grown and caught fishes though. 
<laughs> fat. That's the way it goes. So um, this was Max Boot, who's this former bushy neocon uh, globalist, I guess a Republican at some point. But again, an, another kind of Bill Crystal, Jonah Goldberg Republican who's just beside himself over Trump. Let's listen. You know, I'm just so sick of these ridiculous, outdated, nativist, xenophobic, protectionist arguments. We saw where that led us in the 1930s. Let's keep that in mind. Uh, this notion that Canada is somehow an offender on trade is just bogus. And if Donald Trump and these other uh, Trumpian Republicans are actually concerned about the tariff barriers, let's enter into new free trade accords. The Trans-Pacific Partnership would have actually decreased Canadian dairy protection and Canadian farmers weren't happy about it. But Donald Trump pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership the very first thing that he did. Your reaction, Pat? Well, I think, uh, look, I mean, Mr. Boot, as I understand it, was they're very strong in favor of the interventions in the Middle East. They, they don't have a war over there they don't like. And the whole idea of economic nationalism and economic patriotism is surging in America. It, the idea of nationalism is surging in Europe. I think you've got to understand the sentiment of the age, and the sentiment of the age in the United States is for America to stop carrying the world and start repairing our own country. And this is, uh, Trump is reflecting this frustration in his anger, I think, at the, at the, at the G7 meeting. Also, he's ref reflecting, I think, his desire. Why can't he talk to Vladimir Putin when Bibi is over there, Bashar Assad is over there, the Iranians are there, Merkel goes there? I mean, everybody goes to Moscow or Sochi to talk with Putin. And why can't the United States of America talk with him? I think what's shaping up here is a, you know, if you will, something of, of a new world order in the sense of people looking out for their own national interests. And I do think there's something of this to Trump. He does tend to appreciate adversaries who are doers rather than talkers. And he's not a big fan of folks who, if you will, men of words versus men of action. And he does carry with him this profound frustration at being unable to alter the th way things are, though he was sent here to do it. Yeah, and I think he's he's a very... He's very impatient for change, and he's yeah. he's extremely impatient, and I think he truly believes, and I think he's right, that there's not much time left to turn this around. I, I think he's exactly right, Laura, in this sense. I wonder whether the American people are prepared to make the sacrifices that would be necessary to make us economically self-sufficient, economically independent again, as we were before we entered this whole you know, globalist agenda where the United States has been the biggest loser, $800 billion in trade deficits in goods just about every single year, on again, off again. China last year, a $317 billion trade surplus at our expense. That covers their entire defense budget. And Trump is trying to get change, and the Europeans are, you know, and so he does something, so the Europeans respond. They like it the way it is. Um, this is Susan Rice uh, yesterday, um, and she was on, I guess, Face the Nation. Uh, she was talking about Russia become a member of the G7. Let's listen. It's a disgraceful statement. The fact of the matter is Russia uh, had invaded Georgia. It then invaded Ukraine. We rallied the entire uh, European Union and many other partners to impose tough sanctions on Russia for its annexation. We supported the Ukrainian government to build up its uh, defensive military capacity. And along with our G7 partners, we agreed that Russia should no longer be part of this uh, community of He's the G8. Your, uh, well, let, your, let me respond to that. Yeah. First, with regard to Georgia, that's the war in 2008. The Georgians started, Saakashvili invaded South Ossetia, and the Russians came in 24 hours later, threw him out of South Ossetia, invaded Georgia, then departed Georgia, and they returned it to basically status quo ante. With regard to Ukraine, our people were over there in Kiev, including John McCain and, and the gal over there at the State Department, Victoria Nuland, encouraging the overthrow of the democratically elected pro-Russian government. They succeeded, and so Putin protects his strategic interests. This is the way world nations, great nations, operate. And the idea that you can isolate 
I mean, they call us isolationists, but who's trying to isolate Russia for the fact that it recaptured a peninsula it held from the time of Catherine the Great till 19, until Ukraine broke away from Russia? I mean, so in my view, it, look, it's something we ought to condemn and it's something you ought to deal with, but there comes a time when you've got to move on. I mean, Russia is a... One of the equal nuclear powers with the United States. We got interests in common. We got interests in conflict. And you ought to talk to them. And Trump's, you know, feeling that he's being denied the right to talk to him by the Russophobia that is oh, that is ridiculous. rampant in this city. He's got a point. Now, every time they say Russia, I say China. Every time they say, oh, well, you can't do this. Okay, well, why, why are we doing all this work? Why do we allow China to come here and buy all these businesses? Why do you let them buy all this residential real estate, steal our United, technology? Yeah, the long-term threat to the United States and to, the, to become the greatest power on Earth is not Russia, which has lost, lost one-third of its territory and half its people at the end of the Cold War. The great coming threat uh, is China. And I think everybody recognizes that. And why we're not talking to Russia, I mean, Nixon and Reagan, both of them, they want, they dealt with a couple of adversaries, and they say we got to deal with both of them. And so, you know, they're trying, I don't know what this Russophobia that is rampant in this city, I mean, it used to be the liberals who run this town were the ones always telling the conservatives we got to talk to them. Yeah, well, not when Trump's in, because they, they want to deny Trump a victory and... If Trump is successful, it means their whole thing has been a real fraud for the last 25 years, Pat, right? I mean, that's what they're really angry about. It's their pride. Trump Trump, Trump makes them angry. You know. They lost it all. They lost it all in 2016. <laughs> <laughs> they, didn't, they woke up and said, what? What? I think, I think if Trump keeps doing what he's doing and he doesn't, you know, he doesn't make any cataclysmic blunders, I think he could get reelected in 2020 by a larger margin than 2016. I mean, I, I think I just, it's possible when you look down the line of Democratic potential. I don't see Secretariat there in the paddock. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see I don't see Kamala Harris, the next president of the United States, or Cory Booker screaming his lungs out. Uh, Pat Buchanan, is this really a, a great moment for you to see finally after all these years? Uh, the, the the Buchanan brigades are riding, Pat, but they're uh, they're now they're now riding let's just hope, to save America. But I still have my pitchfork. Hope, as I told a friend, let's hope we're not riding to the little bighorn here. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, well, you know something. This is only a temporary stop. We're Catholics. We we know where we know where we hope. Hopefully, we know where we're headed. Pat Buchanan.